Greetings. Welcome to the Manitowoc Ice October service webcast. Uh, this is going to be course ID ICE 1108. My name is Jared Glines. I'll be your host today. Today we're going to be covering the Indigo Next traditional remote troubleshooting. Uh, the good news is, is a lot of this troubleshooting can also be used on the older traditional remote units, the, the historic ones as well. So we're going to be going through this today and talking about how to troubleshoot it. We usually try to do this at this time of year because uh, with the remote condenser outside, they're getting cooler nights, warm days. And so this is when uh, typically we will see things start acting up if there's a problem within that piece of equipment. So that's what we wanted to cover today. Uh, everybody's muted. All right. So that helps us with the flow. Uh, we'd like everybody to note that, that we will be able to handle questions if you want to ask a question. There is a question and answer feature in this Teams meeting that uh, you can go ahead and click on the icon. It's usually located in the upper right hand corner. Uh, it gives you the ability to open up the chat bar. We do have people monitoring it and uh, we'll watch for those questions and we'll be able to, to follow through with some questions uh, as we go through the day and not get interrupted with a lot of people trying to talk and stuff like that. Also, just like we've been doing lately, uh, we're going to have a quiz at the end of this webcast. Uh, don't worry, it's nothing major. It's not pass fail. Uh, you can take that quiz and, and, as a re and as a reward for taking this quiz, we're going to give you not only a PDF version of today's presentation, but we'll also give you a certificate, a seminar certificate for attending the traditional remote um, uh, uh, field uh, seminar uh, webcast. So hopefully uh, you take that time, put your email in there and, and fill out the um, rest of that quiz, submit it. And again, in, in, uh, as a reward, you'll get a copy of today's presentation and a certificate. All right, so we're gonna move on to the Indigo next. This is the traditional remote. Uh, this is gonna be just the remote condenser located out and away from where the ice is being produced. We'll give you the overview of it. We'll kind of go through some installation related issues. We'll get through the sequence of operation and we'll talk about how to troubleshoot this piece of equipment and the refrigeration system on this unit. So on the overview, uh, just as an update, remember uh, a few years ago, we switched to a three letter alpha, uh, uh, alpha model number matrix uh, because as we were going into the 2018 Department of Energy initiatives, uh, we needed to get a little bit more energy efficiency out of some of our models. And we did that by utilizing a different refrigerant, R410A. Uh, however, some of our machines already met that energy initiative. So those remained R404A. And so as a result, we ended up with a mixed refrigerant line. Not all Indigo Next machines will be running on the same refrigerants. And so we added a new letter to our model number matrix to kind of indicate real quickly what uh, kind of uh, refrigerant we're running in that system. So we're going to use the letter T for the R410A. Uh, as you can see here, uh, the letter F is going to be for R404A. Uh, there are no R290 or 134A uh, traditional remote machines, so we can just kind of eliminate or, or ignore that for now, but uh, there are a couple of R290 and 134A smaller units, uh, and so those uh, would apply on those. Also, the designation on the, our condenser model or serial on the model number matrix is going to be the letter N. That's our traditional remote machine. We've been using the letter N for the traditional remote now for decades. And so we're going to keep doing that. If there's an A, it's an air-cooled, W for water-cooled, and then the C is the quiet cube. Also, as a lot of you probably already realized, we did see uh, 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 Bristol compressors go out of business. We had to find some new compressors to, to fit into that. And so as we made that transition to get away from those Bristol compressors and into the Emerson and Copeland and Embraco compressors, we did see a couple of changes. Uh, a lot of them may not fit in exactly the same way. The wiring harnesses aren't going to be the same. And maybe even the tubing lines up in a little bit different places. So there are some kits. It'll also tell you whether or not one is, is, is needed for your model, depending on which uh, machine you have, which Bristol compressor you're looking to replace. It may or may not require uh, a tubing kit. So just make sure you check with your local distributors. Make sure... Uh, that we verify and see whether or not we do need that uh, conversion kit in order to go from the Bristol compressor and, and over to the Copeland. Now, you might already have the Copeland in there, and then obviously you wouldn't need to, to uh, convert that with the tubing kit, and that Copeland would be indicated by the letter A at the end of your model uh, after your uh, voltage nomenclature. So 
make sure that you check with your distributor. All right, on our uh, model uh, models, we're going to have a 48 inch, 30 inch, and 22 inch wide on the self-contained air and water cooled units. The uh, 48 and 30 inch only on traditional remotes, and we're going to be concentrating today on these traditional remotes here. So only on the 48 inch wide and 30 inch wide machines on that traditional remote. And of course, we do have our quiet cube line. We're not going to talk that about the quiet cubes today, but those come in 30 inch single and dual evaporator and also the 22 inch wide in the, or IB ice beverage units with the remote condenser, compressor, uh, condensing unit located outdoors. So again, we're going to concentrate on the traditional remote today, the 48 and 30 inch wide traditional remotes. We also updated uh, the ice thickness probes uh, a couple of years now. We put a little stop in there to prevent overstressing of those uh, tabs. So as you take those out and put them back in, we're not going to see the cracking in those uh, little tabs. So that's going to help us uh, probably see a lot less of those tabs breaking as we're taking them in and out of those machines during preventative maintenance or even for testing and things like that. So just kind of keep that in mind. So. We talked about the model numbers, and this has been around for a while. Hopefully, a lot of you guys are already very familiar with it. The replacement compressors with the Bristol uh, configurations, what sizes they come in, and also that ice thickness probe with that little tab that stopped to prevent them from overflexing. So, we're going to go ahead and talk real quick about the installation of the traditional remote to ice machines. Uh, on what what makes a traditional remote a traditional remote? Well. The evaporator, the compressor, the controls are all located inside the head of the unit. We're only going to take the condenser and condenser fan motor out and away from where the ice is being um, made. We're going to remove that heat, that heat rejection from that ice machine out with that remote condenser with a line set. So uh, the, the head unit, the uh, ambient ranges on that are anywhere from 40 degrees to 110 de or uh, 10 degrees. Yeah. Uh, water temperature 40 to 90 degrees. We want our water pressure to be right in that 20 to 80 PSI. 80 is our pa uh, maximum water pressure uh, on these ma machines. Outside with that remote condenser, because it is going to be located outdoors, typically uh, those operating ranges for that remote condenser are going to go from minus 20 degrees Fahrenheit all the way up to 120 degrees uh, Fahrenheit outdoors. We also want to have some clearance on that bottom, about 20 inches of clearance for the bottom. The top should be out and open, and then a little bit of room around that uh, as well uh, to help us be able to get in there for cleaning it and maintaining it, or even uh, working on it if necessary. Uh, all of these machines do carry a three-year part and labor warranty, and the traditional remote has pre-charged machines, the, the uh, line sets, and the condenser. They're all going to come pre-charged from the factory with the proper amount of refrigerant in them for the uh, proper installation. So before we get still going on the uh, installation, we want to make sure we have everything we need. We got the head unit, we've got the condenser, we've got a line set. We've got somewhere to put the ice once it's made, whether it's in a bin or on a dispenser or something along those lines. We've got a, a spot picked out for where we want to put it. If we need a safety kit or, or what we used to call our uh, seismic kit, <clears throat> make sure you got that as well. Make sure we got the right lines also uh, for that uh, refrigeration system. On the voltage, we want to verify and see which kind of machine we're utilizing so that we're matching the right voltage. This will be on the uh, in the installation use and care manual. You can also find it in your technician's handbooks if you need to. Uh, and so um, that uh, information is going to be available to us. So verify your nameplate and make sure that everything is indeed functioning or is set up and ready to be done properly. When we hook up the electrical, we'll provide a strain relief. You can use a, a cord, you can do a hard wire. It really depends. You have to meet your electrical codes. Doesn't matter to us which way you utilize it, as long as it meets your electrical code and the wire sizing is proper for the voltage and the amperage of that machine. And so it's also designed in a way that the control board, or I'm, I'm sorry, the contactor inside that ice machine will send voltage out to the remote condenser. And we can use a second uh, cord or something that meets our electrical code to send the voltage out to the fan. Uh, some, some areas may not allow you to do it that way. So you would have to set up a separate uh, 
uh, electrical source out at that condenser, but it is designed in a way to be able to utilize the ice machine head and that contactor to send voltage out to the condenser fan. So when you do install the, the voltage on these machines, you're gonna see L1 and L2 for line one and line two. And then also you'll see F1 and F2 for the fan to send that voltage out to the fan if you can utilize that. All right, on the water supply, we don't want to go over 80 PSI. We certainly don't want to hook it up to a hot water source. We want to use a cold water, potable water source, and, and we can get that uh, set up so that we can supply water to that machine because, well, let's face it, we just can't make ice without water. We've tried. It didn't work. So make sure that we got right around that 20 to 50 range, 60 to 80 is okay, but, uh, you know, I would say even 40 to 60 is probably more of an optimum range for these machines. With the water pressure regulating valve, if you need one, uh, usually come in set at 50 PSI anyway. And so that's a really good water pressure to have on that unit. We're gonna run our drains. We gotta get rid of that mineral laden water and be able to clean the unit. So we're gonna run some uh, drains also. Also keep in mind that on the dump valve drain, we do want to utilize a vent pipe. We, do, we see a lot of installations without that vent pipe. It helps get that water down the drain quicker, get that cleaned out of there uh, as we go into uh, another cycle so it can go down the drain easily. And then we've got our base drain here as well. No matter how well we insulate the inside of these machines, sometimes we do get some condensation given the right conditions and that condensation a lot of times will uh, <clears throat> get that on the base and then it'll go out that base drain if you install it get get that off the bottom of that machine get it down into the drain as well must be able to go to a floor drain it needs to be able to accommodate not only the ice machine and the base drain but also your bin remember your bin is also going to have a drain that needs to be installed uh, in order to uh, drain that ice as it melts in the bin as far as clearance go, we're going to recommend eight inches on the top and on the sides and then five inches on the back. But wait a second, this condenser is outdoors. We're, we're taking the heat away from that ice machine. So why do we need any clearance around the unit? Well, this is for serviceability. All right. So <clears throat> even though, yes, it's not a functional thing, we still need to be able to get in there and clean it and service this machine. And so we definitely want to have uh, some additional room around it. We don't want to shoehorn it into a little cubby hole, although we could functionally, it would work, but it's going to make it very hard for a service uh, technician to get in there and work on that machine and even just simply clean it. And so uh, we, we do recommend the eight inches on the top and on the sides and five inches on the back. And the five inches on the back help accommodate our line sets and our drains and our water and uh, power cords coming in there. As far as the uh, remote condenser, again, we want about 20 inches on the bottom, as much around the top and the sides as possible, just mostly for serviceability. It's gonna be a top air discharge, so it's gonna throw that air, that warm air, just straight up into the sky. And uh, typically, uh, it's just gonna be open to the atmosphere at that point. So uh, don't put anything above it uh, without giving it at least a couple of feet to get that air out of that uh, system through that remote condenser. As far as running the line set, because these are all pre-charged, there is no requirement to shorten the line set. If, if you've got the proper sizing and you've ordered the proper length of line sets, they're available in three different lengths from us. Uh, typically, there's not going to need to be any sort of a uh, shortening or, or anything like that on the line. You might have to lengthen them in the event that we're going a little bit longer than what the line sets are. Uh, but uh, there is no need to shorten them. If you do have excess line set, make sure that you do uh, maintain some other things in, in regards to the, the installation of these line sets. So we can't have a lot of bunt raises and drops and things like that. So in order to be able to accommodate this refrigeration system, this liquid line and this discharge line, we do have a calculated line set distance that we have to adhere to. Now we cannot exceed 100 feet of total line set. We can't do it, no matter whether it's just level and flat and horizontal, we cannot exceed 100 feet of line. However, we need to calculate that line set as well, and that the calculated line set cannot exceed 150 feet. And I know that's confusing, but the calculated uh, portion is gonna depend on how much rise and how much drop we have. 
So we're going to calculate that based upon how much rise and how much drop. And as you can see here on the slide, uh, the rise isn't quite as bad. So we're only going to multiply the foot, uh, the feet of rise by 1.7. But as we drop down, now that's that's really hard on these refrigeration systems. So the multiplier for our drop is going to be six, uh, six and a half, about 6.6 .6 on that multiplier. So if we have a 20 foot rise, we're going to times it by 1.7. That's our 34 foot calculated rise. Okay, see how that works. And then we got 10 feet of drop, which is going to multiply out to 66 uh, of calculated line set length. And then we've got 30 feet of horizontal. So we add all those up. That's our 130 foot total calculated distance. It's within that 150 feet of calculated distance. So that would be OK. That would be approved uh, in regards to that installation. So make sure you do the calculated uh, lines, especially if you've got a significant drop because our drop is um, is one of the harder things to do and you cannot go down more than 15 feet from that head. You cannot have more than a 15 foot drop and you cannot have more than a 35 foot rise. So there's some maximums there as well in regards to the length of that line set. And if you did have that much of a rise and a drop, you're probably not going to make your calculated line set at that point. So again, we've got uh, three different lengths of those line sets. We do have two different kinds of refrigerants. Remember, we got 404 and 410A. Make sure you get the right, right, right line set for the refrigerant that we're using in the ice machine that you're installing because we don't want to mix any refrigerants together. And so uh, we do have them labeled at the end of those um, line sets, which refrigerant we're using in there. So verify and make sure you did get the correct line set. Also on your data plate, the model serial tag on that unit, it's going to contain the total refrigeration charge, refrigerant charge in there, then the weight. This is going to be located on the head unit only. It will not tell you what your total charge is at the condensing unit. It will always refer to the uh, model serial tag on the ice machine itself to verify that we have the proper amount uh, or what the proper amount of refrigerant is in that machine. If we do end up having to go over a 50 foot line set, all of these machines are pre-charged from the factory good up to 50 feet. After that, if we do exceed that 50 foot line set, we may have to add some additional refrigerant. And so the refrigerant adds will be not only in the installation use and care manual, but also in a technician's handbook. If you have your technician's handbook with you when you're installing that machine and you exceed that 50 feet. The quick connect fittings are, are quick connects only. They're a one time deal. You're going to connect them and leave them. Don't ever disconnect a quick connect, all right, because it'll leak. So they self pierce. You're going to put them in there. Maybe use a little refrigeration oil on the thread so we can get a good tight um, seal there so that we don't leak refrigerant. There are Schrader ports there on that uh, discharge on those line sets as well. If we do end up needing to extend our line set, make it longer, or we want to shorten it, even though there's no requirement to shorten it, we're going to just recover that vapor. There's about a five ounce holding charge within those line sets. We'll want to recover that, uh, shorten that line set or lengthen it, depending on whatever case we have. And then once we braze everything shut, we'll go ahead and put a good vacuum on it and then charge it back up with those five ounces of refrigerant uh, and make sure that we're not leaking or uh, anything like along those lines so that we can uh, finish that installation on those line sets. Because of the two different refrigerants, we color coded the caps on the R410A. Uh, they're going to be more of a purple or a pink cap indicating it's the R410A. It matches the color of the jug of refrigerant in, in a service truck. And so that's why we went with the colored, uh, the pink or the purple, whichever color you want to call that. And then the uh, R404 ones would just still be the standard white uh, cut. Um, plastic caps on those line sets. So if you go take off white caps on the back of the machine and you go to take purple caps off of your line set, you might want to stop, okay? Because those are two different refrigerants. We don't want to mix those together. We need to get those right uh, line sets in there so that we can install it properly. Now the question comes up in technical support from time to time. Hey, do I have to use a Manitowoc condenser? Can I use a, a rack system that I have or anything like that, a non-OEM uh, condenser? And the answer is yes. 
in, in the uh, installation use and care manual and in your technician's handbooks, we tell you this is what requirements need to be made in order to utilize a non manitowoc uh, condenser. A lot of more companies are going with just a huge uh, multi-circuited rack so that they can save space on the roof and things like that. But you're going to measure the volume. You want to verify what kind of volume you have in that condenser so that we can add the additional refrigerant. It's likely a lot bigger than the R condenser. And also, we're going to have to also install a headmaster. We have to have a head pressure control valve in that circuit to help us maintain head pressure. We're going to talk more about that head pressure control valve here coming up shortly. As far as a uh, non-manitowoc uh, non condenser, again, we'll, we'll want that uh, headmaster kit that goes with it so that we can maintain head pressure in, in the units and, and it's, it's a requirement. We have to do it. We cannot just use a fan cycle switch. And we're going to talk about the importance of that head pressure control valve and why it has to be in there. Our condensers will come with it already installed. And so in that case, um, you're going to be able to uh, add this on a non manitowoc condenser if necessary to help us uh, not only make the ice, but also in order to harvest the ice in those refrigeration systems. We do have service bulletins out there in regards to the uh, non manitowoc condensers and which headmaster uh, kit you need to order. So those are available on our website at manitowocice.com in the download section under the service bulletins. And that's going to be service bulletin. Um, uh, which one is it? It's for the Mac X and G uh, condensers. <clears throat> So now we got everything installed, everything's ready to go. There is a checklist in your installation use of care manual. Make sure you check off all those things. Make sure that we did all of it. Maybe we missed something. There's a lot going on. We've got water, we got power, we got refrigeration. We got all that stuff going on. It's easy to forget one or something of those items. So go back, double check, make sure everything has been checked off as you move on in order to be able to put that machine into service. So there we go. That's the installation portion of it. We did do an installation webcast earlier this year. So if you wanted to go in more depth into the installation, you can go and review that on our website, uh, more on the installation related. But this is gonna be more uh, as far as the uh, troubleshooting and the refrigeration system on the Indigo Next traditional remote. So on our line voltage components, the control board is responsible for following the sequence of operation, energizing and de-energizing components as it goes through. Uh, based upon the sequence of operation. Also, as I pointed out, the condenser fan motor can be controlled through F1 and F2 in that uh, um, electrical control box on the back of the unit. If your code will allow you to do that, and then that way when the compressor contactor pulls in to send voltage to the compressor, it'll also send voltage out to that remote condenser fan motor. As far as the sequence of operation is concerned, we're going to fly through this really, really fast because we're going to talk more about the refrigeration system on the traditional remote machine. But essentially, the good news is most of our machines follow very similar sequences of operations, at least as far as our cube machines go. And so once you've learned one sequence of operation on all of our ice cube machines, you're going to have a general feel for how they all work uh, for the most part. There will be some sm small changes here and there, uh, but uh, they're going to all operate very, very similarly. Also, with the Indigo Next platform, we can sit there and, and, and stand in front of that machine in the service menu under the real-time data area, and we can watch that machine as it goes through uh, the sequence of operation, whether we want to look and see what the thermistors are reading on the refrigeration lines. Maybe we want to see what the input devices are telling the control board or what the output devices are doing inside that control circuit while the machine is running uh, so that we don't have to sit there and guess. Okay, is this supposed to be energized? Is it not? We can see that right there in real time whether or not it should be running. So going back to the sequence of operation, every single one of our machines when it starts up from a stop will start up in a purge cycle to try to get any water out of that water trough Ice is a food, whether we like it or not. And so anytime we start our machines up from a stop, we'll always 
try to get everything out of that water trough in a purge cycle with the water pump and dump valve energized. We'll equalize the refrigeration system, start up the compressor. We will have pre-chills. There's gonna be a pre-chill on every single one of these. That's gonna help try to alleviate or eliminate the potential for slushing. The free cycle will occur where we're gonna pump water over the water, over the evaporator grid, uh, and, and allow that refrigeration system to absorb heat from it. We'll look for information from the ice probe to tell the control board when the sheet of ice is made. And as we go into the harvest cycle, we'll get rid of whatever water is left over, get it down the drain in the harvest cycle with the harvest valve energized. Once that ice starts to come off, it's going to push open the water curtain or the damper doors. If it opens and closes within 30 seconds, go back to pre-chill, make another sheet of ice. If it stays open for more than 30 seconds, that tells the control board it's time to shut down on a full bin. We do have some uh, timers and some maximums in this sequence of operation in that control board. There is a six minute lock in on every single free cycle that is uh, for the ice thickness probe. So the only way to override that would be to go in and initiate a manual harvest in the service menu. You cannot override it otherwise. There's gonna be a 35 minima, minim, ma, minimum <laughs> maximum freeze time. So the most time the um, that the machine will stay in the free cycle is 35 minutes. So again, we're looking for the ice thickness probe, but after 35 minutes, the control board is going to say, look, I got to have ice on me by now. I'm going to do a harvest cycle on my own. Seven minute maximum harvest cycle. This will include a water assist. And then of course, uh, we've got some timers in regards to our water fill valve, our single evaporator machines, six minutes. That's all the time we'll allow it to fill up with water, but we're looking for the uh, water level probe to, uh, to tell the control board when the water trough is full. Uh, and then eight minutes is our maximum allowable. So there's, we do have a more detailed sequence of operations uh, out there, but we just kind of wanted to go through that real briefly. All right. So how does the refrigeration system on the traditional remote work? Well, we're gonna make the ice first. So as that refrigeration system is running, we've got our compressor, we've got our low temperature, low pressure vapor coming into the compressor on the suction line. It's compressed, that creates a high temperature, high pressure vapor, leaving the dis, uh, compressor on the discharge line. We'll monitor therm with thermistor number two, that compressor discharge line temperature. But now we're gonna send that high temperature, high pressure vapor out through that line set out to our remote condenser. Our refrigerant needs to give up not only its sensible heat, but its latent heat as well. It's going to condense to a liquid. There will be a headmaster out there. We'll talk more about that here in a minute. And it's going to send that liquid back through that line set down on that liquid line to the receiver. And we'll monitor liquid line temperature with thermistor number one as it comes back from that condenser. We'll take the liquid out of the receiver through a service valve, through our liquid line dryer, and then through a liquid line solenoid valve. And I'm gonna pause for just one moment here. Even though there is a liquid line solenoid valve in the traditional remote machine, there is no low pressure switch. All right, this is not gonna be a pump down system. The liquid line solenoid valve is in there for one reason and one reason only, and that is to prevent refrigerant from migrating anytime the machine is in the off cycle. So when we turn the machine off, either at the touch pad or it shuts off on a full bin, uh, we want, and we de-energize that refrigeration system, we want all the refrigerant to stay right where it's at. Don't, don't want it to move at all. And the liquid line solenoid valve helps us achieve that. We'll go through our heat exchanger to gain some efficiency. No matter what refrigerant we're using, whether it's our 404A or 410A, we will utilize a thermostatic expansion valve to meter that liquid out into the evaporator. The expansion valve is gonna force that refrigerant to change state again. It's gonna go from a liquid to a vapor. It'll start to absorb heat from our load. This is where it works its magic. It absorbs heat from the load, which in our case is water. We'll monitor evaporator temperatures with thermistors three and four. We'll absorb that heat from the water, carrying it back over through our suction line, back to the compressor where it starts all over again. Basic refrigeration, right? We're absorbing heat one place, using a compressor to move it and spitting that heat out in another. All right, once we've made that sheet of ice during the freeze cycle, uh, we do have to maintain a certain amount of head pressure because once we do make that sheet of ice, we need to be able to harvest it. So we need to verify and make sure we have enough refrigerant heat in that system in order to properly harvest the ice. And that's why we utilize a head pressure control valve. 
Our head pressure control valve or headmasters have a nitrogen charge inside the dome here. Depending on which refrigerant we're using on an R404 system, it'll be 225 PSI. On the R410A systems, it's going to be 300 PSI. And the magic temperature around that headmaster is right around 70 degrees Fahrenheit. At 70 degrees Fahrenheit and above, we can typically maintain enough head pressure within that refrigeration system during the free cycle that we're going to overcome that nitrogen charge in that uh, headmaster. And so the headmaster basically just sits there uh, quietly in the corner doing nothing. But as the temperatures start to come down, they start to drop down below 70 degrees, we start removing more heat from that refrigeration system. This causes the head pressure to come down, at which point now our nitrogen charge will overcome the head pressure within that refrigeration system. It's gonna push open this little valve here to allow discharge gas to mix right back into the liquid uh, line. We're gonna add some more temperature back into that liquid line so that our head pressure can come back up so we can maintain a nice warm column of liquid at all times to the receiver during the freeze cycle. All right, once we go into that freeze cycle, we also need additional refrigerant in order to help us carry the heat from the compressor to the evaporator during the freeze or the harvest cycle. And so we have a receiver. It's going to store the additional refrigerant that we need. And we're also going to utilize an HPR system. The HPR system is going to allow us to take vapor right off the top of that receiver and add it right into the low side of the compressor and add additional refrigerant into the low side. So we have enough refrigerant to absorb heat from our compressor to our um, and send it out through that harvest valve and over to the evaporator where we need it. And so we have enough refrigerant to carry that heat uh, from the compressor to the evaporator to warm up the evaporator grid with that sensible heat, melt the bond between the sheet of ice and the evaporator so that the ice can release from that uh, machine or the evaporator. On the uh, dual evaporator systems, we've got two expansion valves, two harvest valves. We do have some 48 inch wide machines on the 48 inch ones. Those are gonna be a left and right. We've also got a couple single evaporator upper and lower ones as well, where we're gonna utilize two expansion valves and two harvest valves. This was due to the size of the evaporator on the 48 inch wide machines, uh, but also to gain some energy efficiency. So each side is gonna independently operate uh, with its own expansion valve and harvest valve. But in the freeze cycle, again, we're gonna be utilizing these expansion valves to meter the liquid out in the evaporator. And in the harvest cycle, we'll go ahead and utilize two harvest valves to allow that high temperature, high pressure, hot gas access to the evaporator to warm up the evaporator enough to melt the bond between the ice and the evaporator so it can release. Uh, also, we do have some check valves located within that refrigeration system as well. And due to the check valves in that refrigeration system and the liquid line solenoid valve, these are all there to prevent, help us prevent refrigerant from migrating. If you do have to recover the refrigerant from a traditional remote ice machine, you will need to do a four point recovery in order to get past those check valves and that liquid line solenoid valve. We'll hook up to the high and the low side on the front of the machine, the receiver service valve inside the machine, and to the discharge line on the back of the unit. So if you hook up to those four points, you can recover 100% of the refrigerant from this refrigeration system uh, and get past those check valves and that liquid line solenoid valve. Also, the directions for doing that are in the technician's handbook to help you um, understand the proper procedures for recovering it. We're gonna talk a little bit more about those check valves and, uh, and, and the recovery process here in just a second. So how do we troubleshoot the refrigeration system on the traditional remote? So going back to 2004, going all the way back to the S model, we devised a new way to troubleshoot. Look, we get it. Ice machines are kind of their own little animals. They're not like a lot of other pieces of equipment that we work on on a daily basis mostly because we're using not only a free cycle and a harvest cycle, but we've got water involved, we've got electricity involved, we've got refrigeration involved. And so we, we got it. Our, our machines, ice machines were kind of their own little animal. It was easy to get distracted by all the things going on inside an ice machine, maybe even some that had nothing to do with why we were there. And so we wanted to be able to keep uh, technicians focused out in the field. So we developed some flow charts 
based upon the symptom. Symptom number one would be a machine that's not running, it won't run, and or has a history of shutting down. And you could utilize this flow chart by answering yes or no questions uh, and, and answer those. And eventually, as you answer these yes and no questions, the flow chart is going to take you to a spot that says this is where you need to be concentrating on. As far as symptom number two, this would be a long free cycle, maybe poor ice formation on the evaporator grid, or it might even be a low or slow ice production call. This is something we've been using at Manitowoc to troubleshoot the refrigeration systems in our ice machines for a long time. This was actually one of the first charts we ever used going way, way back, and, and we're continuing to use it. Why? Because it works for us. All right, so if you do end up uh, needing to troubleshoot the refrigeration system on the freeze cycle, whether it's a low production call or you got poor ice formation on the evaporator grid, uh, this is the one that you would use for that freeze cycle. It's our freeze cycle operational analysis chart. But what happens if you're having trouble harvesting? Look, making ice is easy. Harvest has always been the kind of the harder part on ice machines, and so what happens if I've got a situation where I'm not harvesting very well or I'm taking too long to harvest or maybe I'm not harvesting at all? So that's our symptom number three. There is a flow chart specific to traditional remote dice machines on this flow chart. So we're going to start out on the traditional remote symptom number three flow chart. There'll be a separate one for self-contained air and water cooled units also. And there's also separate flow charts for quiet cubes. So we want to make sure we're looking at the right flow chart depending on what condensing option we're using on that machine. So is this a situation where it fails at night or only in low ambient conditions or does it work uh, and work pretty good during the day? If you go, nope, this is pretty much having trouble harvesting all the time. All right, do you have a normal ice fill? Does, how do your cubes look? Uh, are your cubes melted at the end of the harvest? If you are not melted, if you say, nope, my cubes aren't melted, it's still pretty stuck to the evaporator grid. All right, what kind of discharge line temperature do you have on your compressor? Why does that matter? Remember, we need to have a certain amount of heat in that refrigeration system to properly harvest the ice. So we have to be able to meet that by making sure our compressor discharge line temperature is at 150 degrees or more to ensure that we have the proper amount of heat in order to harvest the ice. If we don't have enough heat, it's going to tell you to go back to symptom number two. This is actually a free cycle problem because during the free cycle is where we're building up that heat and we need it for the harvest cycle. If you say, yep, I got plenty of heat, that's not the issue. All right, is your harvest valve energized? If not, why isn't it? Are you even in harvest? We have a loose connection somewhere. Why are we not getting voltage to the harvest valve? If you say, no, I've got voltage to my harvest valve. All right, now we'll have to gauge up and take a look at those refrigeration pressures. In the harvest cycle, is your head pressure higher than it's supposed to be and your suction pressure lower than it's supposed to be? I don't know, how am I supposed to know that? You need to have your technician's handbook with you to make sure that you have it. We're going to tell you what pressures you should be running in the freeze and in the harvest cycle. And so you're going to compare your harvest pressures to the, the pressures in the technician's handbook based on your model. And again, if your head pressure is higher than it's supposed to be and your suction pressure is lower than it's supposed to be, that's your harvest valve every time. You need to replace your harvest valve. What if you say, well, you know what? No, my head pressure is not too high and my suction pressure is not too low. Both my head pressure and my suction pressure are too low. Well, if we're, we've got low head pressure and low suction pressure, I'm going to tell you we better take a look at that HPR system or harvest pressure regulating system. Remember, its job is to feed extra refrigerant into the, the, the compressor during the harvest cycle. We can't get it from the condenser because we've got those check valves there preventing that refrigerant flow as we go into the harvest cycle. So maybe that's, that HPR system's not doing its job. And that's why we would have low head and low suction. Those check valves, again, are gonna prevent that refrigerant flow from the condenser and the line set. We need to utilize that refrigerant in that receiver in order to feed that refrigerant into the harvest cycle to give us the amount of refrigerant we need to gather heat from the compressor and carry it over to the evaporator during that harvest cycle. So low head, low suction, 
Let's look at that HPR system, that harvest pressure regulating system. Let's make sure it's actually feeding the proper amount. The HPR system is going to try to maintain on our 404 system anywhere from a 70 to 100 PSI. It's going to feed that vapor into the low side of that compressor through that solenoid valve and the regulating valve on the R410A systems. It's going to be set a little bit higher, so we'll be running, looking for about 120 to 160 PSI from that HPR system into the low side of the compressor to fill up that harvest cycle with that uh, additional refrigerant. And again, make sure you look at your technician's handbooks. These are just kind of estimates. Those are the ranges. Your technician's handbook will tell you based on this ambient condition, this is where your harvest pressures should be. So keep that in mind as we're uh, looking at that HPR system. Now, <clears throat> we've got low head and low suction. Before we attempted to troubleshoot or condemn that HPR system, we first need to make sure that our freeze cycle is 100% normal. Our freeze time is normal. Our pressures are normal throughout the entire freeze cycle. And we have the proper compressor discharge line temperature by the end of that freeze cycle. If we don't have proper compressor discharge line temperature, guess what? That also creates low pressures. We do not have the amount of pressure that we need or, or heat because we've got low discharge line temperature. If our free cycle is 100% normal, all right, then we're going to replace the HPR system. It might be the solenoid valve. It might be the regulating valve. That's a 50-50 chance. And even though those are pretty good odds, I wouldn't take them. If we do condemn the HPR system, change them both so that you don't uh, miss that 50-50 chance. Because I'm never that lucky. If I took my chances and did a 50-50 one, I'd get the wrong one for sure. There's really no way to know for certain which one of those is preventing that refrigerant flow, that vapor flow through uh, the HPR system to the compressor. All right, so if we say, nope, we don't have low head and low suction in harvest, everything's normal. Well, in that case, if you've got the temperature and you've got the right pressures, you should be looking at symptom number four where the backs of your cubes are melted out. This We shouldn't be on the uh, the chart that they are not melted out on. All right, so let's go back to that HPR system. Remember the very first thing said, does it fail at night or and, uh, and in low ambient and run during the day just fine? Well, no, we went the other way. We said, nope, it, it was having the problem at the time, but maybe it is. Maybe uh, it runs great all day and overnight it has a problem and the customer says, yeah, it shut down again last night. What's going on? Well, maybe, just maybe, it has to do with that uh, headmaster. Remember that headmaster's job is to maintain a warm column of liquid at all times. And as we start getting those lower temperatures, if it's not doing its job, we're gonna end up with cold refrigerant coming down. We need that heat in order to harvest. So how do we determine whether or not it's a head pressure control valve? At night, it's getting down into the 50s, but geez, I come in and it's in the 70s now. And so uh, how in the world am I supposed to troubleshoot that? Well, you got two options, okay? You either come back in the middle of the night when the temperatures are low, well, we're not gonna do that, or we're going to uh, simulate a low ambient condition. Uh, the the flowchart will tell you to get a, a garden hose and some water and spray water into that condenser to simulate that low ambient condition. And that's how we'll tell if we uh, have a low ambient or a head pressure control valve issue or even a charge issue in regards to that head pressure control valve. Because remember, if, the, if we're um, maintaining a head pressure above the nitrogen charge inside the dome of that head pressure control valve, it's not going to show up in a, low, in a warmer ambient. 70 degrees and above typically is the uh, warmer ambient, but as those temperatures come down, uh, we're going to see the pressures drop. That headmaster needs to go into a bypass and add that temperature, add that discharge gas right back into that liquid line to hope it warm that liquid line back up so we can make sure we've got enough heat in that refrigeration system in order to properly harvest the ice once it's made. So as we get our, our water hose out and we're spraying water into the condenser, we're going to grab a hold of that liquid line don't need to measure the temperature. Just use your hand, grab a hold of the liquid line. As you're spraying water up into that condenser, there's only a couple of different things that can happen. If you've got normal discharge pressure and that liquid line stays warm, okay, while you're spraying water into the condenser, 
then we're looking in the wrong place. The headmaster's doing its job. Everything is working fine. This is not the low ambient condition. That's what we want it to do in a low ambient. We want it to maintain that warm calm of liquid. However, as you're spraying water into that condenser, if that liquid line starts to get cold and starts to cool down, well, that tells us the headmaster is not doing its job. It's not adding discharge gas back into that refrigeration system. So we'll need to replace that headmaster in order to resolve that problem. However, if we're spraying water into the condenser and that liquid line starts to go hot, it gets hot like the compressor discharge line, well, that means the headmaster is doing its job. It's trying to get the head pressure up by bypassing that hot gas, but the problem is, is we don't have enough refrigerant in the system in order for it to function properly, and so we would need to find that leak. We're low on refrigerant, find that refrigerant leak, get it repaired, get it charged back up to the nameplate, uh, and so we can get that machine back into perfect operation. Now, there's one more failure up here on this uh, chart. This would not show up during the low ambient condition, but it's it's in the technician's handbook as a potential failure. But if you've got really high head pressure with a hot liquid line, typically you'll be going off in a, on a high pressure cutout quite a bit then that means that the headmaster's stuck in bypass. It's bypassing the condenser all the time. And so in that case, it would need to be replaced, whether it's stuck in the bypass or not bypassing. In those cases, you would definitely need to replace the head pressure control valve or the headmaster. All right, symptom number four, we're looking for a long harvest cycle. At the end of the harvest, we pull the cubes off. We look on the back, they're kind of melted out. Good news is this is not a refrigeration problem. If we're melting out the backs of our cubes, uh, we've got all the heat in the system we need. We've got all the refrigerant we need in our system. Something's holding on to that ice way too long. We can look for, for evaporator damage. We can look for grid damage. We'll look at the plastics. We're going to look to see whether or not the machine's just dirty. Maybe it's scaled up. Maybe it's just due for a really, really good cleaning. Uh, also, keep in mind that if the cubes are hollow, if there's not a lot of uh, um, full cubes, you might be going into harvest prematurely. A lot of te people tend to forget uh, that uh, gravity plays a big part in our harvest cycle too. And so if we have really hollow cubes, that means we lack the amount of weight that we need on that sheet of ice for it to harvest properly. And that would result in a little bit of an ice meltdown and maybe even some uh, faults full bend conditions as well. When we're talking about evaporator damage, we're not just talking about the metal grid. We're talking about the plastics all the way around it. Maybe they're loose, maybe they're cracked. Uh, if we see any loose uh, plastics or cracks in it, then that means water's getting in uh, behind there. It's freezing in behind the evaporator, and that's all got to melt from behind the evaporator for the ice to release. So when we talk about evaporator damage, it's not just the grid, not just the nickel-plated co uh, copper evaporator, also the plastics. So if you do have the cracks in the plastics or if they're loose, we can replace uh, a lot of cases, the top and the bottom plastic pieces to help resolve that without having to replace an entire evaporator. We can usually do do that with just the top or the bottom extrusions. Uh, also, scale buildup, all right? If the machine is really, really dirty, it's gonna cause it uh, to have some trouble getting the ice off the evaporator grid during the harvest cycle uh, properly. And that will result in a little bit in that ice meltdown. So that's how we troubleshoot the traditional remotes. Utilize these flow charts. They're, they're there to help keep you focused. Again, there's a lot going on inside an ice machine. It's easy to get distracted by a lot of the things that are going on inside that ice machine. And these flow charts helps keep us focused so we're not letting all those other distracting things uh, keep us from the task at hand, trying to identify and correct a problem in the machine. So again, we're going to break it down into symptoms. We've got flow charts for each one of the symptoms. And as we utilize those, It'll help us understand and, and bring us to the place where we need to focus in order to resolve the machine. Or in a lot of cases, it'll tell you if you change this, this will solve your problem in this machine, including uh, being able to troubleshoot the headmaster and the HPR system on the traditional remote units. Okay, we're going to update you a little bit on the training. Our next um, webcast is going to be on November 16th. We're going to talk about the quiet cubes. We'll do the quiet cube troubleshooting in November on the uh, um, 
in the webcast like we did the, the uh, traditional remotes on these. The quiet cubes also have a head pressure control valve, but it also serves additional purpose in the, the quiet cube. So make sure you join us uh, next November on November 16th for that quiet cube uh, fields. Um, <clears throat> so, excuse me, webcast, and we'll talk a little bit more about the headmaster because it has two jobs in the in, in the uh, quiet cube machines. We still have a lot of online training available, self-taught. It's available to you at no charge on our website, manitowacice.com. Under the service tab and training, there's modules, there's videos. We're, we've got, uh, uh, we've been posting the videos of the webcast, the recordings that, that happen live. We'll post them for, for viewing later. We also can sign up for our monthly reminders for the uh, webcasts. And so all of that information is there. Uh, we'll continue to develop more and more videos as we as we move forward and as time allows. Uh, trying to get more videos out there to help out service technicians. Seems like the younger generation tends to, to learn a little bit better by watching a video as opposed to reading uh, the information. So we'll continue to try to develop and release these new training videos as, as time allows as we move forward. So. Uh, we can also access those with QR codes from our smartphones at the event that we wanted to watch the video. So we're coming to the end of our webcast. Will is putting um, the uh, link for the, taking the quiz into the chat section right now. Here's a QR code as well. I think I did forget to thank Will for joining me today at the beginning. Uh, Will York is helping us. Woohoo, Will! Uh, so. Thank you so much for attending. We appreciate everybody uh, coming out and spending an hour with us today. Uh, so you will see your, your QR code and your quiz now. Um, so thanks a lot once again, and we'll see you next month.